I'm Carol Schill. I'm the State Public Affairs Director for the Livermore State. I've had the privilege to be a part of <clears throat> Tri-Valley Interfaith Interconnect for several years. I feel very blessed to have got to know so many wonderful people from diverse cultures and religions in the Tri-Valley. Um, a little housekeeping before we get started. We have um, restrooms just outside this door and then back in the corner there are more restrooms. It has been several months since Mayor Sophie and the Muslim Community Center of Pleasanton when he presented this idea to, our, to me to have this event at our church. I think it's been almost a year. He's agreeing with me back there. He's recording this. Um, and finally, after many e emails, lots of emails, Sarah and I and Munir, just lots of emails back and forth, it just, it's so wonderful to have this all come together today. As members of the LDS Church, we're so happy to be able to host this event. And I just want to share with you, um, back in October 2001, right after the And it was called September 2009-11. Um, our then prophet of the church, Gordon B. Hinckley, spoke to all the LDS people throughout the world. And I just want to share a portion of what he shared with us that October following 9-11. This is his quote. This is not a matter of Christian against Muslim. <clears throat> We value our Muslim neighbors across the world and hope that those who live by the tenets of their faith will not suffer. I ask that our own people do not become a party to, in any way, to the persecution of the innocent. Rather, let us be friendly and helpful, protective and supportive. We will begin with an invocation by President Scott Adams, first counselor in the Livermore Presidency. Following the invocation, we'd like to invite Assemblywoman Catherine Baker to say a few words. her way up. I'll just share a little bit about her. Um, she's represented California's 16th Assembly District since 2014. Before joining the Assembly, she worked as an attorney advising small businesses, individuals, and nonprofits. Catherine earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and a law degree from UC Berkeley. Go there. <laughs> Um, she's married to her college sweetheart, Dan, and they have um, two children. And then I did do a little Facebook stalking yesterday, <laughs> just, just a little bit, um, an hour or two. <laughs> and um, go to her Facebook page. She's just involved in a lot of great things in our community, including many um, interfaith activities. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the Livermore State for hosting us here. It is wonderful to and um, this is about the fourth or fifth uh, program like this. I've had an opportunity to attend, so I thank you for being here. And at this time, helping us understand one another better. Uh, I attended a program, I want to say in October or November, Pleasanton State, I believe, on the importance of religious tolerance in the world, uh, hosted there. And many messages came to me 
uh, from that program, but one was how much more peaceful and productive societies are when they are tolerant of one another, and how critically important it is to our well-being and our opportunity to thrive as individuals, regardless of your faith. And the examples abide all throughout the world and all throughout history. And part of being able to be tolerant and accepting of one another is learning about one another. And it gives us an opportunity to find our areas of common belief and common respect and shared values and emphasize that more than areas where we might be different. And so I wanted to be sure to be here today. This is a day I usually block off just for family and laundry and groceries. Uh, that happens on Sunday. Uh, but this is important for us to be together. So I say thank you and express great gratitude. And also to members of the panel and to members of this stake and others in the Tri-Valley area who are part of our Interfaith Advisory Council uh, that I assembled last year to find out ways in which our state office and our community can be um, learning more about one another, bridging divides and differences, and stand, frankly, in solidarity with one another when we feel another is under attack. And uh, those members have been great counsel and advice to me throughout the last year, and I'm appreciative for it and will look for more opportunities. And with that, I say assalamu alaikum, and I look forward to the program. Thank you for having me and uh, for being here, everyone, today. Thank you. to our very distinguished panel. We're so excited that they've taken time out of their day to be with us. Um, Aldi will be the moderator for this, so I will, I will turn this off. Thank you. Let's show our love for the organizers, Carol. <laughs> Catherine mentioned uh, flourishing, and there's a book, it's called The Arts of Intimacy. And it's, uh, it's about when the three Abrahamic faiths would compete in beauty. There was a civilization, a time in history, when the three Abrahamic faiths lived together, and they competed in beauty. And that was how civilization was created, in a beautiful manner. So anyone who wants some homework? The arts of intimacy. The arts of intimacy. And today is a stepping stone back in that direction. And I want to congratulate, I want to congratulate the organizers for taking this beautiful step and having us here today. One more time. So actually, Carol, the word etymologically comes from, uh, it, shares, it shares with the meaning of a uh, person who plays a flute and brings beauty to a chorus. And so that's what she's doing today. And Munir Safi means illuminating purity. So, uh, so we, have some, we have some good organizers and hopefully we can live up to those standards. Today. Uh, so, uh, Martin Luther King says the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. And that's a very, 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 and uh, we have a, we're in a predicament today because a lot of people actually, uh, uh, unfortunately, misunderstand Muslims or Islam. And so today, the way we have our panel set up is first to remove. I call him our first speaker, our myth buster, is to remove the false notions and, and misconceptions uh, from what Islam, what isn't Islam, followed by what, and, and Mike Kim, who also speaks on that wavelength, followed by what is Islam. And so hopefully after we remove uh, some of the feathers that prevent us from seeing the beautiful mountain of Islam from our eyes, then hopefully we can, we can see more clearly the, the later panelists, and each panelist speaks for approximately 15 minutes. The, uh, when I was in law school, I graduated in 2005, and my best friend was a Mormon in law school. And he said, you know, we should be best friends, because you're a Muslim and I'm Mormon, and both of them have two M's. <laughs> I was like, yes, I agree, right? And, uh, and every Thursday, uh, they did something called bar review, right? There's something called bar review because you know a lawyer takes the bar at the end of law school, and uh, and so they would come to me and they'd say, "Hey, man, you come to the bar?" And, and actually, they weren't studying for the bar; they just go to a different bar, <laughs> right? And so they'd say, "Mandy, come with us," and and they're, and then I'd say, "Hey, 
Mike Garrett's not going. Go talk to him. <laughs> He's not going either. Go talk to Mike, because he, would, he wouldn't drink either. Uh, he was my former friend, Mike Garrett. He was a gentleman. He was an awesome man, and he made my law school experience better. So that's why I'm actually pretty excited to be here today. Um, and uh, I actually feel, with all the suits and ties, I actually feel like I'm in a law firm. <laughs> so, thank you for making me feel at home. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, but I do, I, I, I do want to thank you, you know, I, I'm not going to welcome you to your own center, um, but I want to thank you. Uh, th this is a meaningful step for me personally, you know, I, I, I'm American, I've been here my whole life, born and raised in Chicago, lived in Minnesota, lived in Orange County, and I've been here for about five years. And uh, I was just talking earlier, I think, with Troy. Is it Troy? Yeah. Yes, sir. And, uh, and Troy mentioned something. He said, you know, what motivates this is fear. You know, fear. Uh, fear, fear, of, fear of Muslims. And I said, you know, it's actually fear of Muslims and fear by Muslims. Because both, both, both parties are actually a little scary. You know? Uh, so I have three daughters. And the title of this panel is called The Muslim Next Door. So it's almost like a personal touch. Like, who are these Muslims next door? Who are they? You know, what are they? You know, what do they eat? You know, when uh, my neighbor, my actually true neighbor, Jim and Judy, um, he's like, we want to have you over for dinner, but I don't know how to cook halal. <laughs> <laughs> so halal is actually just any chicken or beef or, you know, that you can get from, from a local, uh, you know, like kosher, it's similar. Uh, and so you can cook, you know, you can cook, uh, uh, Shepherd's pie, halal shepherd's pie, you know? And so there's a lot of mystery to be debunked and a lot of myths to be removed, hopefully today. But I want to thank you because it's motivated by fear. I'm a father. And I have, you know, my daughter's right there. She's waving. Hey, man. <laughs> Love you, baby. She's also my assistant. She's pretty good. She's wonderful. She, uh, so her name, her name means faith. Her name means faith. Uh, blossoming faith with her middle name, Iman Rabat. And, uh, and, and I don't see myself living anywhere except in America. This is home. So when someone shouts, go home! Okay, I'll go to Chicago. <laughs> where do you want me to go? <laughs> Irvine, California? That's where my wife is from. That's where she was born. Her mom and her parents are from UCLA. So where should we go? So this is home, and, and you're making this feel more homey. You know, so we've already succeeded because of you, because of Carol, and because of Munir, and, and thank you. And so, uh, our first panelist, Hina Mukhtar, is a teacher, a principal, a uh, manager of a homeschool uh, co-op in Lafayette, California. She's a writer, a speaker, and she's also a wife, and a mother. <laughs> uh, God bless her. I mean, uh, she's a good friend of mine, and she's our Mythbuster, and uh, she's going to address some of the, the more common misconceptions. But at the end of our panel, we have a, a very important session, which is our Q&A session. So anything that we don't address, there are some note cards. Please feel free to write any question, and we'll talk about them at the end of our panel. Please do welcome Hina Mutar. our opening uh, remarks, and I was going to say the same thing, that my best friend in high school was a Mormon, and uh, I still remember when I started high school, we, I actually, I'm not from Saudi Arabia, but I grew up there because my father's job was transferred there, and uh, when we came back to California and I was starting high school, my mom actually told me, look for the Mormon kids, they have similar values to us, and uh, I like them, and They'll, they'll be good company for you, so seek out the Mormon kids. And my best friend was Mormon in high school, so a lot of uh, similarities and a lot of kindred spirits. So I would like to re reiterate the thank you that Matthew uh, passed along to all of you. And I wanted to make clear that, yeah, I'm here to admit this, and I also wanted to make clear what some of our goals are not. And two of our goals that we are not aiming or is one where we're not here to proselytize. And we're also not here to give our personal opinion.
opinions or viewpoints on religion or politics. We, the five panelists up here, represent a majority of the Muslim world. 87% of Muslims are Orthodox Sunnis. And just like with any other religion, there are various de denominations and sects that come up in faith traditions. And we represent Orthodox traditional Islam, which is known as the Sunni school of thought. And um, Dr. Asad and Mike are, like we said, are going to be going into what Islam actually is. And I'm going to be sharing with you some of the common myths that I come across in interfaith work. I don't have time to go through all of them, but two of the most common ones that come up, I'm going to try and tackle in the next 15 minutes or so. And then other myths that might come up, any other questions you might have, we can try to tackle them during the Q&A afterwards. So the, the first one I wanted to talk about was, um, I, I spoke at a church in, in Danville. And during the Q&A, an, uh, an elderly woman stood up, and she was really upset, and her voice was shaking, and she said that she was really upset because Sharia had come to America and had taken over, and that now our laws and courts and judges were deciding uh, cases based on Sharia. And she wanted me to answer that question, and I didn't even know where to start with the misinformation. I, it was obvious that she needed to be appeased and to be uh, to have her heart and mind set at rest, but it's a it's a common misconception that comes up, and you know throughout history, pretty much in every culture, there's always a boogeyman. There's always somebody who's the other, and some group that's coming to take over and take away our way of life. And right now, unfortunately, Muslims are in the hot seat. Um, my parents moved here in the 1960s, and they remember when it was all about the Russians. But right now, it's uh, our children who are the ones who are having to deal with, with these misconceptions. So that's the first myth, that Sharia is coming to take over America. So I wanted to kind of demystify what Sharia is. So first and foremost, Sharia is a moral code for Muslims. Before, it's a legal code, or actually more than a legal code, it's a, it's a moral code. So it's more concerned with sin than it is with crime. So for example, if I were to tell a lie to my friend, there's no earthly law that's going to hold me accountable for lying to my friend. But according to Sharia, my understanding is that I will be held accountable by God for telling um, an untruth, for not being honest. And it's Sharia that would make me aware of that fact. And so then I realized, okay, there's steps I need to take, you know, repentance, and changing my ways, and telling the truth. So we Muslims worship God with their mind, their bodies, and their souls. And sometimes it's translated as the heart. And Sharia is concerned with the body. It's everything to do with the physical aspect of our lives. So how we dress, how we don't dress, what we eat, what we don't eat, what we drink, what we don't drink. Um, it's our marital relations, it's our inheritance laws, it's uh, basically everything to do with the physical aspect of being in this world. And it tells us that what is allowed and what is forbidden. Now one thing that people may not realize is that in Islam, we are not allowed to live under anarchy or chaos. Some form of government needs to be in place, even if it's not a Muslim one and you need to respect the laws of the land. And so the highest law in the land in the United States of America as of right now is the Constitution. And so Muslims, according to Sharia, are required to respect the Constitution of the land. If they disagree with the Constitution, or if the Constitution or the laws of the land are hindering a Muslim's ability to be a Muslim, then Sharia requires that Muslims migrate. They leave that, the, that land where they're being oppressed, or where they're not allowed to practice their faith. So thank God we're not there yet. And um, you will not find anybody who is more concerned about protecting the Constitution right now than the Muslim community. Um, OK, so we'll just talk about the elephant in the room. This is what people think is Sharia, and that's what they're actually asking about, even if they don't say it. And what they're asking about is what are known as 
penal code punishments. So they, they see these horrible, you know, images and videos on YouTube or in the news of beheadings and cuttings and honor killings. Um, I put it in air quotes because there's no honor in honor killing. And whippings and stonings, and they think that that is what Islam is about, that that's how we practice our, our lives. And uh, first and foremost, you should know Muslims are just baffled by those videos. And Muslims are often the victims of those kinds of crimes. Um, but yes, there are penal code punishments in Islam. They make up 0.1% of the entire body of Sharia. It's a very, very minuscule part. And just like with the United States um, laws, we have capital punishment here for certain offenses. Sharia also has a form of capital punishment. But there's important differences um, between capital punishment in American law and capital punishment in Sharia. The first is that the penal code is first and foremost actually meant to be a deterrent. It's not actually meant to be implemented. And the second is that the evidence required to prove, establish proof of a punishable crime makes the punishment practically almost impossible to implement. So I'll give you the example that the penal code punishment for adultery, according to Sharia, is death. However, the evidence required to prove that adultery has taken place is not somebody walking in a room and seeing two people under the bed covers or even seeing a pregnancy that takes place. It's actually four witnesses who've seen with their own eyes actual <coughs> penetration. That's what's required to prove that um, adultery has taken place. So what is the point of saying that the punishment for adultery is death. The point is actually to show to the Muslim community how high the level of sin is in God's eyes. And it's a deterrent. It's, you will stay away from something that where you're told that this is what God says is the punishment for adultery. And it's also meant to make sure that it doesn't become widespread in society, that if people are going to do anything like that, it's going to be kept very, very private and really not out in the norm. Okay, um, the other important fact for everyone to understand is that according to Sharia itself, the laws of Sharia can only be applied and upheld when there's a legitimate Muslim government in power. And a majority of the Muslim scholars today are in agreement that no such government currently exists in the world. And therefore, there's no official body which has the authority to implement penal code punishments, which, like I said, only make up 0.1% of the body of Sharia law. But unfortunately, when you hear the words Sharia law, people just think of grisly punishments. They don't think that Sharia is the reason that you know I, we take care of our parents, that Sharia is the reason that we are respectful of our teachers, that Sharia is the reason we obey the laws of the land. In fact, I had a teacher once tell us that um, if you run a red light on purpose, you're actually supposed to ask God to forgive you because according to Sharia, you're breaking laws that you agreed to follow. God, please forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> so, before moving on to the next myth, I, I wanted to share with you the principles and foundations of Sharia. And so we believe that all Sharia laws were, are divinely inspired and that therefore they're the perfect set of laws for mankind. And if you closely study Sharia, you'll find that each and every part of Sharia is meant to protect one of six values. Every Sharia rule will be protecting one of six values. And they are, the first is the value uh, of religion, meaning that you can't force anyone to convert. Uh, the value of life, you can't kill anyone unjustly. The value of family and lineage, everyone has the right to know where they come from, that's why sex is confined to marriage. The value of honor, so we can't slander or backbite or lie about people. Tabloid journalism is something that would not be allowed under Sharia. Um, the value of intellect and reason, so that's what makes us different from the animals, is the fact that we have the ability to think, so that's why Muslims will not partake in intoxicants, um, alcohol, and recreational drugs. However, Sharia is nuanced. You are allowed to have anesthesia for surgery. So there's, uh, you know, 
gray areas to everything. And then the value of property. So you can't steal, usurp someone's wealth, cheat anyone out of what belongs to them. So those are the six values of Sharia. All right, the second myth that I'm just going to quickly cover. Uh, I was in Trader Joe's, and a woman stopped me and just started making you know, a little chit-chat. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, she said to me, by the way, you do know to call 911 if he ever lays a hand on you, right? And I was stunned because I had no idea what she was talking about at the moment, but obviously it eventually dawned on me that she was referring to another very common myth, which is that women are oppressed in Islam and that women don't have rights and that they're abused. Um, just like any other member of the human family, there are some Muslim women who are oppressed and there are some Muslim majority countries that have a culture which is oppressive to women and there are some stories of domestic violence in Muslim households. But the question everyone needs to be asking themselves is does Islam actually teach or condone or support the oppression of women? Islam, the actual religion that we practice. And the answer is absolutely not. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that the best of you are the ones who are the best to their women. And the majority of the focus of his last sermon before he passed away was on the rights of women. And Muslims believe in the story of Adam and Eve, just like Christians and Jews, but in Islam, Eve is not held accountable for Prophet Adam's mistakes. They were both held equally responsible. She's not the one to blame, She's not considered to be a temptress. She's not the reason mankind lost paradise. So that's a, a big thing to know about your history as a woman. Now, there are a few reasons that Islam gets a bad rap. One of them is what we see on the outward. People see the hijab, the headscarf. It gets translated as headscarf, but hijab actually means barrier. Um, it sets up boundaries for interactions between men and women, and it's very visible, and people often don't understand it. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't see the hijab and think of the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. one of the most noble women in history, according to Muslims and Christians. Um, they usually wonder why women have to wear it and not men. And what many people don't know is that men also have parts of their bodies that they're required to cover, according to Sharia, just like women do. So for men, they have to cover from the navel to the knees. So you won't see men wearing, Muslim men are practicing, um, you won't see them wearing speedos or shorty shorts or anything that's going to reveal their belly buttons. And for women who are practicing and observing the hijab, they will cover everything but their hands, their face, and their feet. And so why the different rules? We believe that Sharia is divinely inspired, right? And even here in we have different rules based on genders. So, so, for example, if a man is jogging in the park and he gets hot and sweaty, he can pull off his shirt and continue running topless. But if a woman were to do that, she'd be arrested for public indecency. And, but why? Why are the rules different for a man and for a woman? From a Muslim perspective, it's the understanding is that God created us and he knows best what our different limits are. The other thing that um, people see is in the congregational prayer, they'll see uh, women praying behind men, and they'll think of it in the framework of like Rosa Parks, right? Like, oh, Rosa Parks is forced to the back of the bus, it must be because women are treated like second-class citizens, that's why they're praying in the back. It actually has nothing to do with that. If you look at the Muslim prayer, we stand very closely, it's very intimate, <coughs> shoulder to shoulder. Um, we stand, we bow, and we prostrate on the ground. <coughs> Our bottoms up in the air. It's um, most women are, would not be comfortable having a man behind them when they were in that position. So it's really more about privacy and modesty, and it's about being able to focus on your relationship with God. Where you stand in the prayer has nothing to do with your closeness to God. The person in the front does not have a higher spiritual position than the person in the back. Um, and the third uh, reason that people get confused uh, is really seeing what some governments are doing and the types of laws they've implemented on the female population. Um, Saudi Arabia just now changed their rules. Uh, I left in 1986, I can't believe it took this long. Now in 2018, they're saying that women are finally gonna be allowed to drive. 
But the fact that women couldn't drive all that time in Saudi Arabia has nothing to do with Islam. It's got to do with a Saudi law that the Saudi government decided for their citizens. And, but unfortunately, you know, the, the holiest cities in Islam, Mecca and Medina, are in the modern country of Saudi Arabia. And so people automatically assume that, well, if Saudi Arabia, they think, well, it must be like the Vatican or something. If they're deciding this rule, then it must be representative of all Muslims. And that's not the case. They actually don't have any uh, legitimacy over the world's population of Muslims. So, yeah, I mean, I've had people say, like, oh, how can you be part of a religion that doesn't allow women to drive? I'm not part of a religion that doesn't allow women to drive. <laughs> That's a Saudi law. So I'm just going to wrap with, up with that, and we'll, we'll talk more during Q&A. Thank you. Then I mentioned the human family, and it's good to put that in perspective. We share almost 100% of our DNA, whether you like it or not. Yes, with me, even with me. Uh, we also share something else. We share not only our Aunt Anne and father, Prophet Anne and peace be upon him, we also share our forefathers, the forefathers that founded this country. And that's something to be proud of, and that's something that we associate with without uh, reluctance or hesitation. And uh, we hope to, to continue beautifying this country. Amen. Uh, and its journey in, in this civilization, in this world. Uh, and, and Muslims were in the Revolutionary War for America, as history has documented the name of Bam Pitt Muhammad. He fought in the, in the Revolution. And uh, Muslims have been here uh, since then. I think a quarter or a third of the slaves brought to America were Muslims, building this country, establishing this country. Uh, does anyone know the first country to recognize the existence of the United States of America? Morocco. <laughs> Morocco. And they've had the longest lasting treaty with a country, a Muslim country, America, with Morocco. And so that's, that's something to know. How many Muslims serve today in the U.S. Armed Forces? 4,000. 4,000 serve today in the U.S. Armed Forces. Um, which group reports more suspicious activity to the FBI than any other group? Muslims. Muslims report more suspicious activity. And actually one time uh, in Orange County where I used to live, there was a man who was suspicious and so they called CARE, Council of American Southern Relations, and they're like, hey, there's this suspicious dude. He's acting all weird. So CARE then reported him to the FBI. Said, there's a suspicious dude. And they're like, oh, sorry, he's our agent. <laughs> They actually didn't say that at the time, but eventually it came out, and there were papers, and he ended up suing the FBI because they used him as an agent. So, so you know, that these are facts to be recognized. Less than 6% of domestic terrorism is by Muslims. So why this disproportionate reputation? The, the, from the last few years, the, the statistics have come out of who the, the which, which groups have uh, perpetrated the greatest terrorism. It wasn't Muslims. It wasn't. We don't need to name any groups because that's not the business we're in. <laughs> Our next panelist has the lovely task of talking about this. <laughs> Mike Kim is a graduate of the Naval Academy. He served this country uh, and continues now to serve in a different regard in real estate. Uh, he's also a father of seven, so that's probably where he serves most. And uh, he has the lovely task of talking about uh, this topic that uh, has unfortunately plastered our media and our lives in a disproportionate and unnecessary manner of jihad, ISIS, and etc. Please welcome Mike. So, you know, I want to just add one minute to what they were saying before, the interconnectedness of the three Abrahamic faiths. I just came back from Mecca and Medina on a trip, and I stood on the ground that Adam, where he, put, where he put the foundation for the first place of worship, where Abraham, with his son, built the first place of worship. This is all in Saudi Arabia, 
where uh, 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 Prophet Jesus will be buried when he comes back. We believe in the story of, of, of return of, of Christ as well. There's Prophet Muhammad so is buried, then his two companions, and right next to it is an empty crypt where Jesus will be buried. The interconnectedness are incredible. The, the spot where Adam and Eve re-adjourned here on earth after you know they did what they did. So, you know, this is in Saudi Arabia, Mecca and Medina. So you know, it's, it's really interesting how interconnected we really are. So before I um, address the topic of ISIS and Jihad, I'll do my best to do so. I just want to share with you a quick background on myself um, and why the subject was of, of interest to me, to give you some context. So, um, you know, 22 some odd years ago, uh, growing up here in the Bay Area, um, Islam was just a foreign concept. Uh, I was subject to the, the, the mass media like everybody else. I had very negative views of Islam and Muslims. They were just the crazy people, not like us type of feelings. Um, and it wasn't until my freshman year uh, at the Naval Academy where we were given an assignment. And I wasn't much of a believer either, for that matter. I guess I would check the box Christian on some application, but you know, I, I didn't really uh, participate in religious activities. But what was interesting was, in my freshman year, we were given an assignment uh, where we had to summarize the biographies of all the eminent scientists and philosophers and mathematicians in the Western civilization. So I was in the library flipping through some books, and I was about to fall asleep when I read a passage that, that literally jarred me awake, and it said something to the effect of how all these eminent scientists and philosophers and mathematicians in the Western civilizations were believers in a transcendental or a universal which are sanitized terms for the creator, creator of God, right? So that really shocked me because that the most revered and widely studied and respected minds in the Western civilization were believers in a God. Further, that their life's work were inspired by the desire to know the created universe. So, you know, René Descartes' Cartesian Cortex, so you should understand the geometric relationship in the created bodies. You know, also some of the primary uh, uh, laws of physics by Isaac Newton were to try to understand origin of motion, how did God begin you know, motion. So uh, it just really opened up a whole new avenue. It's launched me on a quest, really to quest to find out what this is all about, asking the big questions, right? So as a consequence though of, of my inquiry in reading and debating, and, and I think I pretty much discarded the Naval Academy curriculum and ended up reading pretty much the entire volume of the great books from Socrates, all the way to Hume, Spinoza, and, and St. Thomas Aquinas, and everybody in between, trying to understand what these great minds were going after. Um, in time, so as a consequence, you know, I, I held, I think I walked with a pretty high bar on what type of religion I was going to adopt for myself. Because to me, you know, revelation had to uh, really be ahead of, of all, and, and address all of our issues and concerns. And I'll give you one example. Scientifically, revelation to me, had to be ahead of scientific discoveries. And I found that to be the case in, in Islam, um, where there's many scientific concepts presented in the Islam, which were for many years a, a mystery, until such time we discovered it scientifically for ourselves and, and, it came, and it was validated. Just one example, as a navigator in the Navy, the mysteries of the oceans are still perplexing to, uh, to the best of uh, oceanographers and scientists today. And one concept is that, it, where, for example, where the, the Mediterranean flows into the, um, the Atlantic, the salinity, pressure, and temperature remains distinct for many, many nautical miles. And still, we're trying to figure out why that is, because it creates weather disturbances, and it's our business to know. The cross speaks about that. And, and, and it speaks about it through a revelation of a desert Bedouin prophet who's never seen the ocean. So, these are just one of many examples of, of, of why, for me, it, it made a lot of sense. In the, in the subject of, of, of combat and war, that was also very important to me, obviously, because that was the profession that I chose as, a, as an American naval officer. And one thing that we learned at the, at, that we teach at Annapolis and West Point is the, the, the need for discipline and ethics in battle. And the reason why is because if you don't have discipline and ethics in battle, uh, you, you can lose your mind, you can lose your humanity, and you can walk away from the battlefield permanently damaged uh, if you don't conduct yourself in a, in a disciplined uh, and an ethical manner. So, you know, when, when I came across with the idea with the Islamic jurisprudence that, that the means have to justify the ends, 
and the ends and the means both need to be just, it rang true because we, we teach that at Annapolis and West Point that the way in which you conduct warfare, the means have to be just as to the end itself, the military goal itself. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's not Machiavellian where the ends justify the means. That's, we, we are not about that. It's not about that in the American ethical uh, construct, nor is it in the Islamic. So that consistency, that kind of, uh, you know, reigned true, and so I began to look into it more. And what I discovered was quite fascinating because, um, again, in, in the corpus of Islamic teaching, the concept of warfare, just warfare, is much more voluminous and refined and complete, I found, than the best of our Western traditions, which is an embodiment of, of you know, experiences in World War II, World War I, um, the Nuremberg trials, uh, the Geneva Conventions, you name it. But the Islamic body was, was I found, much more comprehensive, as I said. Um, uh, it, it, the Quran says a couple of, it states a couple of passages, I think, that captures it. It says, permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made, because they have been wronged. Those who have been driven out from their homes unjustly only because they said, our Lord is God. So fighting is, it should be done defensively, is what that statement says. And the next statement is even more telling, where it continues and says, And if God did not repel some men by means of others, there would surely have been pulled down temples and churches and synagogues and mosques. And notice it doesn't say just mosques, it says synagogues and churches. So it's incumbent upon all Muslims to protect any house of worship, be it a mosque, a synagogue, or a church. So fighting is permitted for defensive purposes only, and the primary means is to, is to, is to protect people's right to religion. So that's, a, that's it, stated in the Quran. So all of this obviously was, was quite interesting, and, and I continue to uh, look more into it. And, and Muhammad, the, the final prophet, we believe, uh, he's a central figure in Islam, obviously. And, and it was interesting because he speaks a lot about war. And I found that interesting because he was a, a prophet. We don't necessarily connote prophets to people of, of, of war, if you will. And, 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 but in actuality, because the Prophet Muhammad was the final prophet for all humanity, he represents a, an example to us in all aspects of human existence. Um, you know, be a father, a teacher, a student, a warrior, a businessman, you name it. He's, he's all of those things that leaves a, a, a rich body of, of, of work that, that, that helps us and guides us in, in all those endeavors and all those aspects of human existence. Um, just to give you an example of uh, his guidance during the times where, where he had to oversee combat, he gave very specific instructions to his troops. And he said, ten rules. One, do not harm women, children, elderly, or the sick. Two, do not commit treachery and never mutilate or disfigure. Three, do not uproot, cut down, or burn trees. Four, do not harm any livestock except for food. Five, in combat, avoid striking the face, for God created all of us in the image of Adam. Six, do not kill monks in monasteries, and do not kill those sitting in places of worship. Seven, do not destroy towns and villages. Do not spoil cultivated fields and gardens, so you can't starve people for, as a tactic. Eight, do not wish for an encounter with the enemy. Pray to God to grant you security, but when you are forced to encounter them, exercise patience. Nine, no one may punish with fire except the Creator. So weapons of mass destruction, chemical nuclear, all those things will be not allowed in this one. And ten, accustom yourself to do good, people do good, and do not do wrong. <coughs> Excuse me, even if they commit wrongs. So that's the the means by which we conduct. <coughs>
Okay. Now, the implication by the meaning of the word itself 
is that a Muslim is one who surrenders themselves over to God uh, and thereby attains to some uh, degree of peace and wholeness in his or her life. Um, a Muslim can be from any part of the world, any background. Um, as you all know, because of the Christian background, Christians aren't from Jerusalem or Bethlehem, right? They're from all over the world, various cultures. Uh, here are some famous um, faces that everybody, everybody sort of recognizes, at least a couple of those faces. Anybody? Call them out. Cass, Cass Stevens, Muhammad Ali, Dr. Oz. Yeah, okay. Yes, Dr. Oz has that right behind him. So, uh, so a Muslim can be from any um, particular background, uh, any culture, um, and, and any race and ethnicity. But one other definition I'd like to spend some time on is the word Allah in Arabic. Uh, and Allah is simply the Arabic word for God. Uh, it is a proper name uh, for God, uh, but it's also used not just by Muslims, but by Arabs who are Arab Christians or Arab Jews, um, and in their own services, will use the word Allah, right? So here I have um, an image from the book of Genesis. Um, and it says here, uh, In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. Um, so what an Arab Christian would call God is simply Allah. Uh, the reason that I think this needs to be said is, uh, many people like to make Allah sound like it's a God other than the God of Abraham. because it's And they'll use something famous because it's another word. And I remember I had this in work, um, to, to, to use Matthew's example. I sometimes, you know, in a public setting, I'll forget and I'll use the word God very comfortably. Somebody asked me, hey, are you going to do such and such with this patient? I said, yeah, I'll get to it, God willing. Right? It just came out. Uh, and the guy looked at me and goes, God, I thought you believed in Allah. Right? <laughs> And then I just, I was really confused by that comment. And I just, it took me a second to say, yeah, it's the same thing. It's just two different languages. That's like saying, agua, I thought you wanted water. Right? <laughs> uh, so, so in that sense, uh, I think it is important to sort of, in this demystifying thing, to understand that we believe in the God of Abraham, Noah, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus, uh, Ishmael, Moses, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them all. So uh, we hold Allah to be uh, uh, the God that sent them all. So Islam sees itself, uh, it's important to understand this, how does Islam view itself vis-a-vis -vis other religions? Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, scholars of religion will, will, will describe how religions view other religions. Uh, and Islam sees itself as a culmination of previous religions of God. That it's not that the world was in utter darkness until the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came along. But that God sent a succession of prophets uh, to all of humanity. Um, there's actually a tradition from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that says God sent a, mess a prophet to every people on earth. Uh, and there were over 124,000 prophets. Now, we don't know all of these prophets, but what we would know is if we encounter a tradition like the Ohlone Indians, right, we would say that God had, did not leave them without guidance, but at some point in time, they were sent with a messenger that gave them some semblance of the message that you were created by God, you will be resurrected, and you should live accordingly, right? Some, some version of that, right? Um, and so, so what Muslims would say is that truth is out there, uh, and Islam is simply the uh, complete culmination of all of that. Um, and so sometimes you will hear Muslims talk about um, Islam with a lowercase i. Um, and here I have that distinction for a reason. Um, because what if you look at the Qur'anic narrative, the Qur'an being the holy book of Muslims, you will see many phrases like Abraham saying, I am the first of the Muslims, right? Or Moses saying, I am a Muslim, right? And if you read that, you'll say, wait, but they were born like millennia, centuries before the Prophet Muhammad. How are they Muslims? Uh, what we would say is Muslims in the sense of surrendering over to God, the generic form of Islam. That all of these religions were surrendering to God. If you were on the ark with Noah, you were surrendered to God. If you didn't get on the ark and said, I don't believe that anything is coming, then you rejected God's message. So in that sense, we believe in a lowercase i Islam that permeates um, other faith traditions as well. There's a famous statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that I think illustrates this beautifully, where he says, to paraphrase that 
you know, uh, God's message to humanity, you know, speaking in parable, is like a beautiful building. And people are walking around saying, what a beautiful building. What a beautiful structure, except it's just missing one brick there in the corner. And he said, I am that final brick. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, doesn't see his mission as replacing the work of his predecessors, Jesus and Moses and Ishmael, right, etc. He sees it as completing and continuing. Um, so in order to really understand the religion of Islam, so now we've talked about some definitions, right, how it fits in with other religions. I want to talk about the essence of the religion. And these are, the, the quiz at the end of this talk will be on these three things here, right? Uh, faith, conduct, and character. These are the three uh, dimensions of the religion of Islam. Um, so I'm going to go through them. Conduct, which uh, our sister Henna already uh, referred to, these are the, the, the bodily dimension of being a human being, right? These are the actions in our lives. So God calls upon us to do certain things and abstain from other things. So Muslims have five main devotions. But who here has heard of the five pillars of Islam? By show of hands. Almost half, right? The five pillars are, are refer to the five pillars of conduct. But if you really want to know a, 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 a basic framework for Islam, it's the faith, conduct, and character. So for conduct, the first is the, that a uh, Muslim has to believe in and state these two testimonies. That I testify that there's nothing worthy of worship, save God. Right? This is what's called radical monotheism. To reject all other things, whether idols of the heart or idols in reality, right? that divinity is, is one, um, and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a final messenger uh, of God. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later. We, uh, we have five daily prayers. And these aren't prayers in the sense of asking God for things. These are ritual devotions. Five times during our day, um, Regardless of how busy we are, we try to take out um, several minutes to sit down and to worship God um, out of gratitude. Um, the third is a purifying charity, that anybody who is above a certain uh, poverty line uh, is to give 1 40th of their excess and unused wealth for the year. So it's not a tax on your income, uh, but it's your savings. So if you have over uh, uh, a year $40,000 left over that you didn't have to use for your family and your own needs, that one out of that 40 should be given to the needy. Uh, the fourth is fasting a month called Ramadan. This is uh, 30 days in which Muslims fast from the break of dawn until sunset, abstaining from food, drink, and intimacy. Uh, and this, uh, and when uh, after sunset, uh, it's permitted to eat again and, 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 and uh, go back to sort of a, a, a normal uh, existence. So the fifth is pilgrimage. That uh, this was a city that Mike was referring to, the holy city of Mecca. And it's mentioned in the Old Testament as Becca with a B, so that sometimes it changed its name historically over time, but Becca. So making a pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca, founded by um, Ishmael and Abraham, uh, was one of the outer, uh, outer line tabernacles for the, for, for the Jews that they would visit. But this is uh, where a Muslim must uh, perform pilgrimage at least once in their lifetime. So these are the five basic devotions that every Muslim, if they're able to, has to adhere to. Um, and this is conduct. Faith. So Muslims, obviously, being a religion, they have things that they believe in. Faith. Things that we believe in are not things that we do. These are truths that we hold in our, in our, in our minds. So the first is to believe in God. Uh, the second is that we believe in angels, that God has these intermediaries that communicate with and, and, and act upon the world. Uh, conducting his will. We believe that they don't have free will, um, but they are beings that are, that are act, they're real in existence. Um, that God sends scripture, so that there is divine revelation uh, to humanity through these angels and through the prophets. Uh, we, uh, we affirm the, divinity, the, the divine origin of the Torah, the Psalms, the Gospel, and the Quran. We hold the Quran to be the final revelation. Uh, and then we believe in messengers, that God, and we talked about this briefly, that God sends um, people to their uh, respective communities to tell them uh, about God. Um, and so one sort of note worth mentioning here is that for Muslims, Jesus is a, is a prophet. You may have heard me sort of allude to that. Um, so Muslims will say uh, that he was born of a virgin birth, he was the Messiah, he will return at the end times, uh, but that he was... Uh, that he was the son of God in the metaphorical sense, uh, that, that, that he was godly, 
uh, but not God the Son uh, in a literal sense. So probably closer to early, early Unitarian views uh, of Jesus. Um, and that he was a, a prophet who will sort of return, and as Mike sort of alluded to, a die a mortal death, etc. Um, and then the day of judgment, that we believe that all of us will be resurrected um, and be held accountable for our, uh, our moral responsibility. The things that we do in the world have real meaning. And that nobody gets away with anything, even if we think they get away with it. Nobody really gets away with anything. And the final um, uh, sixth object of faith that we hold is that we believe in what's called divine decree. That nothing <coughs> happens in the cosmos outside of God's design, so to speak. Um, and so that everything is, is happening according to his will. So before I get to the third uh, dimension, we said faith, conduct, and character. So we talked about faith and conduct. I want to talk a little bit about the Islamic understanding of what it means to be a human. So there are two dimensions worth mentioning here. The first is that we believe that our souls have a primary nature. That each of us, the soul that God created, um, has an innate knowledge of right and wrong. In a love of, of everything that is beautiful. There's a reason that if you're a healthy person, right, and you see like a baby coo and smile, like who, who can resist smiling back at that, right? Uh, unless your, your primary nature has, has been disturbed for some reason. There's a reason we all love sunsets. We can appreciate the beauty of nature. And that nothing that man makes, the most beautiful architectural structure, still pales in comparison to a beautiful mountain range or something like that, or the Grand Canyon. Um, that's because of our primary nature. Our souls see something. They see God's uh, fingerprints, metaphorically, on that. And so uh, that's our primary nature. At the same time, and we all know this if we're honest with ourselves, we still have a selfish side of ourselves, the ego. And this is the part of us um, that, that is a result of being in the corporal realm, right? That when once, once the soul is put into the body, it develops this ego that's has a capacity, even a thirst for, um, the, the, you know, fulfilling its passions and its desires. It's covetous, right? It's jealous. Um, it can be vengeful when it, when, it, when it sees itself wronged. So, when we come to the dimension of character, uh, the primary uh, process is for a Muslim to engage in what's called the purification of the soul. So this is a, a, a spiritual exercise by which and I think this is universal to almost all religions, uh, by which we have to uh, purge these tendencies of the ego, the selfishness, the hatred, the jealousy, the envy, uh, all of these things, we have to purge them. And we have to nurture um, and, and adorn ourselves with the soul's true nature, which is to love God and to love neighbor and to be giving and to be sacrificing and to be altruistic. And all of these things that religion commands us to listen to the better angel of ourselves. Um, and also, in, in, in alignment with that, part of, part of developing character is to live a life uh, that is centered on uh, God and heaven, in one sense. What does that mean? What that means is that Muslims have a type of asceticism. Um, and this is not an asceticism like some of the early Christian monks who would retreat and leave society, um, very difficult sort of spiritual tasks at, at hand there. These, this is an asceticism that all of us are to adopt. So it's to be in the world without being of the world, right? Without being worldly. That we can be here, right? But know that this is a temporary bus stop and that we're gonna go to the next station soon enough, right? Um, and what that means is that when we, uh, you know, there's that bumper sticker kind of line where it's like, you're supposed to love people and use things, but unfortunately we use things, and, and we love things and use people. Um, that a Muslim asceticism is to see that this world is simply matter in the hand, right? And it shouldn't work its way into the heart. It should be in the heart are those noble things, loving God, loving your neighbor, um, and, 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 uh, and so to bring it all together, um, just to sort of recap, Islam and its three dimensions of, what is it? Faith, conduct, and character, right? Um, is seen as uh, a reaffirmation of all previous religious traditions. Um, and by surrendering to God through our minds, that's the faith, right, of what we believe, um, in our, with our bodies, in terms of, of, of moral and upright conduct, and with our souls, developing 
um, more, more purified character, uh, virtuous character, that we will bring peace and harmony both to ourselves but also to our families um, and, and to society at large. Uh, Islam will, will, is, is sometimes referred to in the Quran as the middle road, um, that in religion, religious paths tend to take, um, can take one of two extremes sort of on the spectrum, uh, to use Aristotle's term, the golden mean, right? Uh, that it can either become, uh, it can either have the law in, and to the exclusion of the spirit, or it can have spirit to the exclusion of law. Islam calls for um, a marriage of law and spirit, where in which the rich legal uh, teachings of the Torah and the spirituality of the gospel are merged in this, in this, uh, the faith, conduct, and character uh, of a Muslim. So here again is sort of a summary of all the slides, like off. Um, thank you for your attention, and if you guys, I'm sure I left lots out. If you have questions, I'll take for the Q&A. Thank you. So we're going to continue with the, the, the mic segment, and we'll put it at the first part of the Q&A. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A session uh, after a small stretch break. However, before that, we have our grand finale, We Save the Best for Last, uh, my teacher and role model, Sarah Kim. Sarah Kim is uh, uh, a mother of seven. Here's Dr. I only have three, actually, and my, wife, uh, my wife's name is Amira, which means princess, and she takes that very seriously. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so Sarah is going to share with us uh, how uh, to balance uh, being Muslim and American, and how we can successfully intertwine that and beautifully. Please welcome Sarah Kim. Hatred for people of color. 
He openly insulted and disrespected black people. He frequently used the N-word. I remember being very uncomfortable with his attitude and actions towards blacks. So naturally, I exonerated myself from being racist. In hindsight, however, I realized that the post-civil rights era in the South was still rife with unspoken racism. Though there were African Americans in the town where I lived and in the school that I attended, we had very little to do with one another. I didn't have any black friends. I didn't live near black people. I didn't sit near black people in class or at lunch. Basically, there was minimal to no interaction between them and us. Separate but equal may have been banished by law, but it was alive and well in everyday actions, even in mine. In my mind, however, I was all American as apple pie, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed high school cheerleader. My European ancestors landed on American shores in the early days of settlement. My mother is part Native American. I lived in southern suburbia and was the daughter of a self-made businessman, attending some of the best public schools in the area, along with church on Sundays and I had my mind set squarely on attending the service academy after graduation. So who could possibly be more American than me? In 1996, I had completed a couple of years at the US Naval Academy before realizing that military life actually was not for me. I transferred to the University of Maryland to get my degree in civil engineering, married my husband Mike, and had our first son, Ben. Mike was still in the Navy and stationed in Japan, and I stayed in the States to finish my degree. And it was at that time that I was introduced to Islam. Since my talk is not about my conversion story, I won't go into much detail about how I chose to enter into this religion, but I do want to share with you how becoming Muslim completely altered my understanding of race. Before I do that, however, I think that this would be an appropriate time to share a few of the Islamic teachings regarding race, which come to us via sayings from our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him or via verses taken from our holy book, the Quran, which we believe to be the direct word of God. As I share these with you, please keep in mind the opening lines of the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, the document that formed the foundation of our nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. In Islam, we are taught the same. We are taught that righteousness is the only quality that makes someone virtuous in sight of God. Not race, or skin color, or lineage, or the country that one comes from. In his last and final public sermon to the Muslims over 1400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, very clearly addressed this topic of racism when he said, O oh people, your Lord is one and your father Adam is one. There is no favoritism of an Arab over a non-Arab, or a non-Arab over an Arab, neither red skin over black skin, or black skin over red skin, except through righteousness. We were also taught by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that God created Adam from handfuls of clay and dirt, collected from the different areas of the earth. So just as the dirt of the earth is different colors, we have black soil, white sands, red clay, the children of Adam come in different colors as well. Finally, he taught us, there is no good in red skin or black skin, but our value lies only in our righteousness and in our closeness to God. So these are some of the teachings of Islam that slowly began to permeate my life and to help me develop a deeper understanding of the problems with racism. However, there was one crucial time in my life that these teachings really took hold of me and taught me the true essence of what it meant to be an American. My father, at the age of 50, was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor and given two months to live. I wanted to take my young son, Ben, back home with me to South Carolina so that I could take care of my father in his final days. He readily agreed to have me come home, but firmly warned me against trying to convert him to my new religion. I had become Muslim only three months prior. I assured him I would do no such thing, and I headed to South Carolina. Interestingly enough, in a short period of time, after quietly observing me and my worship and noting my newfound mindfulness that I had brought to my day-to-day -day life, my father began questioning me about my new faith. 
Facing death, he was forced to think about his own mortality, so he started seeking answers to the questions of what, what might be coming after death and what had been the real purpose of his life. I tried my best to answer his questions, but my own limited knowledge of my new religion couldn't satiate his deep curiosity. He peppered me with questions and I literally ran out of answers. In desperation to provide him with what he was looking for, I searched for a local Muslim community where I might be able to find someone that he could speak to, someone who could answer his questions, anyone who could give him the answer that I simply could not provide. I searched in the phone book, I asked around, nothing. I could find no Muslims anywhere near us. I was desperate. I, 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 for nights, I prayed to God. Though I didn't know everything about Islam, I did know that one of the irrefutable tenets of the religion is that one condition of prayer is that you have to recognize and submit to the knowledge that only God has the power to answer your prayer. And answer it, he did. One morning, my father stumbled across an ad in the local newspaper announcing the grand opening of an Islamic center in the very next town. He eagerly showed it to me, and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was truly a miracle. God had sent us some Muslims. That very next Saturday, we drove to Rock Hill, South Carolina, to meet those Muslims in the hopes that they would help my father settle the affairs of his soul. To my surprise, and honestly, to my very deep disappointment, we saw that the entire group was comprised of African Americans. Not one other white person was in the room. My heart sank, certain that this was a mistake. Deep down, I knew that there was no way my father could be guided to a new belief system through a group of African Americans. It just wasn't possible. He had been conditioned all of his life to hate them. But another fact that we are taught in Islam, God is greater. What you often hear as Allahu Akbar. God is greater than all the limitations that we place upon ourselves and the limitations we place upon others. For in fact, when my father emerged from that center, he was a man deeply moved by all those whom he had met. He was a man who received the answers to the questions that had remained unanswered for so long. And he was now a man of the Muslim faith. God is truly greater than anything we can imagine. Through the words and the actions and the sincerity of those whom he had been groomed to hate, he had found acceptance, love, and a faith that he would embrace as a practice of, and a means of drawing closer to his creator until his death almost one year later. May God have mercy on him. This is something Muslims say about those who have passed, similar to when people say, God rest his soul, or may he rest in peace. The black Muslim community in South Carolina took very good care of my dad and me. They would invite us to their homes every Friday after the congregational prayers. My father would be with the men, and I would hang out with all, with all of the women and the children. The men became an unwavering web of support for my father, teaching him, guiding him, and helping to come to terms with his impending death. While I was comforted by and thrilled by the, with the peace that my father had found, this was actually a momentous turning point for me as well. For the first time in my life, I had black friends. They were more than friends to me, however. They were my sisters. We would pray together, sing together, eat together, and laugh together. It was a beautiful and memorable time in my life. It was a Friday in February, nearly one year after my dad's conversion to Islam, when he returned to his Lord. At the time of his passing, my two-year-old son, Ben, an African-American brother named Abdullah, and I were all sitting at his bedside. By the way, Muslim women often refer to Muslim men as brothers, and men often refer to Muslim women as sisters, out of respect. Anyway, this brother had come to visit my father so that he could read from the Holy Quran in his presence. Muslims believe that the recitation of the Quranic words in Arabic brings solace to the heart, and specifically the reading of a chapter called Yasin helps to ease the soul's passing from this world to the next. So it was through the lips of this black man that these verses aided my father's soul. And it was the brothers from this black community who came to pick up his body. And it was they who washed his head and his limbs, who perfumed him, who shrouded him, and prepared him for his burial. They arranged for his funeral, transported his coffin to the cemetery, 
lowered his body into the ground, and then prayed over him in accordance with the Islamic rituals of burial. There were rows and rows of black men praying for my father's soul. If only my grandfather had been there to witness that tremendous and powerfully ironic scene. So that was the starting point from which all my unrealized racism started to melt away. It was at this point that I became truly Muslim and truly American. I understood unequivocally the power of humanity without preconceived notions or discriminatory underpinnings. And upon moving to California, I have continued to be blessed with the most amazing friends and community members from all backgrounds, races, and religions. It is on this premise of mutual respect for all of God's creation that I have found a true kinship with all races and all people. I have been taught that to treat everyone with dignity and respect is an act of worship. Because of our faith, my life and my husband's life and my children's lives have been elevated. And I hope and pray that we will always be positive contributors to the greater society in which we live. I can surely say with immense gratitude and humility that I am a better human being and a better American for it. It is my sincerest wish that my children, along with all of the children of our Muslim communities, will lead future generations of Americans based on the premise of God's command to get to know one another in peace and to respect and respect and to create a life that uplifts all that is good and suppresses all that is evil. Thank you for taking the time to get to know all of us and for honoring me by listening to my story. I sincerely pray that this afternoon is just the beginning of a wonderful new, new friendship, God willing. These are your Muslims next door, a naval officer, uh, a ranch manager, a principal, an ER physician, a lawyer, a mother and father of seven, a husband, a wife. These are the Muslims next door, so no need to fear anymore. <laughs> Don't be scared. No dogs, Negroes, or Mexicans. Jews not allowed. Irish need not apply. Caution, beware of nations. Jabs keep moving. This is a white man's neighborhood. These are some of the realities of the history of our nation. And today, it's the turn, it's the Muslim's turn. It's the Muslim's turn. But hopefully it's a phase that with these acts of beauty that you guys have done today, in our competition of beauty, that we will overcome this time in our history. I mean. So we're going to take a, a short break. Uh, it's for, we're going to take, ten, we'll reconvene at 410. And there are some sweets uh, uh, to enjoy, and there's also some cards. So prepare your uh, question. If you have any questions, there are cards there. Please be, please be true and raw and authentic, and make this meaningful. Write any questions you have, and pass them up, or we'll collect them. Um, my, bring them right up here. My daughter and Dr. Esau's daughter may collect them. Uh, you guys want to walk around and collect the cards at, in a few minutes. And then we'll reconvene at 410 with uh, the, uh, the ending continuation of Mike's ideas related to jihad and ISIS. Thank you. So in, in Islam, jihad has a root word of juh, which means to make an effort and struggle with your in, internal ego. So it's the suppression of that irascible uh, soul that we all contend with. So all of you in this room are performing jihad. That's the meaning of the word. That's the greater jihad. And by way of example, the Prophet Muhammad was once uh, asked by a young man who asked to join the military. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, perform jihad by serving your parents. So that's the greater jihad. You have the ability to serve your parents. Go do that. In another example, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the best jihad is to speak truth to a tyrannical leader. Okay, so those are just a couple of examples of the greater jihad. The lesser jihad is, 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 it does uh, contain military warfare, which I discussed earlier. But some of the conditions of, of military warfare and jihad that I think are interesting is that uh, you have to be attacked first, for, so for defensive purposes only. It can only be declared by a legitimate authority or ruler 
So for ISIS, for example, they don't have a nation state. So by definition, they cannot perform warfare, organized warfare, because they don't have an organized uh, a nation or governmental structure. They were desperately trying to form one, but thankfully they failed or are failing. Okay, so that's jihad. Um, religiously, everybody, every Muslim is required to, per to perform the greater jihad, which is the struggle with oneself. But not everyone is, is required to perform the lesser jihad, which is the warfare component. So there are strict criteria for which you can perform in, in military campaigns. Okay, ISIS. Um, so ISIS is a, a, a geopolitical condition um, that, are, are, that were born out of a power vacuum in the Middle East, in large part created by us, the United States. We left uh, Syria and uh, Iraq and, and Afghanistan with the infrastructure, security apparatus completely decimated and uh, nefarious regimes filled that power vacuum. I suppose it would be no different than if uh, Russia were to theoretically take over the United States, destroy our military apparatus and security system and leave. Who would fill that power vacuum? My guess is probably the Mississippi militia, you know, people with, people with weapons and a, you know, and then somebody in China would be calling them terrorists, I guess. So anyways, that's ISIS. Um, we don't believe in vigilante justice, and that's what they do, and they're, they're vigilantes. They're outside uh, of Islam. They have no legitimacy in the eyes of Muslims. They kill more Muslims than they do anybody else, so we, we have no affinity, no relations to their theology, their brand of whatever. Um, and I guess the best way to describe it is that, you know, maybe the KKK, is to Christianity what ISIS is to Islam. So it's an aberration. And that's it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so I took the two most difficult questions. <clears throat> I gave the rest to our panel. And so uh, this one says, this question is for, this should go to Mahdi Amin. I love you. I think it's from my daughter. <laughs> I also took this one. This should go to Esad Tarsin. It says, I love you. From his son. So that's my part. I'll give you guys the rest. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to take one question uh, here. With the love you have of peace and kindness, how does it get turned into hatred of America and everything we stand for? It's a great question. It's a great, 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 great question. Very real. Um, the first thing I do is challenge that uh, the, the perception is much greater than the reality. The perception is much greater than the reality. So, for example, if you look at the numbers related to terrorism, uh, Muslims historically and even in modern times, uh, conduct uh, closer to the lower amount of terrorism. However, they get the most attention. So that's an anomaly. The, that, that's an absurdity. Uh, and it's disproportionate, as we talked about. So the numbers themselves, if you look at them, uh, they're misrepresented. So if you wanted to, for example, take the amount of attention that the media gives to each ethnic group that conducts terrorism. <laughs> there would be a lot of other groups that get a lot more attention. Muslims, if you do that comparison, Muslims get about a thousand something, I did the math before, a thousand something more attention than they should. If you do the ratio, the ratio of the time, the time given in the media versus the actual numbers. According to the FBI, Muslims conducted less than 6% of domestic terrorism. So, so that's number one, that's the challenge. Uh, number two, I would say that I think actually most of the world loves, most of the Muslim world loves America, and I would say metaphorically and figuratively worships America. Most of them want to be American, want to be American. When I used to travel abroad, you're from America? Oh, can you tell me a word in English? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, do you know this word? Guess what word they'd say? They'd say all the bad words. <laughs> Can you say that word? I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to say that word. No, thank you. Right? And they knew all those words. But there's an affinity, there's, a, there's an attachment to, to being American. So I actually push back a little in that second sense and say that most people actually love 
love America. So that's number two. The third, acknowledging the reality of why there is, uh, there is uh, ill feelings, it's politically motivated. It's politically motivated. And so for political reasons, uh, whether they are hostile, ignorant Muslims, and there are many of them, hostile, ignorant Muslims who are imbalanced and their anger controls them instead of their, their sage, you know, their inner dog controls them instead of their inner intellect, their king, their minister. Uh, so there's imbalance, and so it's politically motivated, and uh, it's not going to be a religious motivation. Uh, my, my uh, yeah, I'll conclude with that. Let's pass it to the next one. Okay. Um, I, I want to add just a footnote to, to Matthew's, um, which is, you know, I, I think sometimes Muslims are seen as solely a product of their religion without any humanity to them sometimes, right? So it's like, oh, why are Muslims bad drivers? It must be some verse in the Quran, right? Uh, sometimes many of the things that happen are simply human nature, right? Um, us versus them is as old as humanity itself. It goes back to Cain and Abel, right? Um, and I think most of the hatred you can see between any two peoples is the ego and um, Satan getting the better of those people. And I don't think it's that much more to it. I, I believe. Uh, because if you read most people's scriptures and their teachings, they'll say, yeah, I know I should be patient and forgiving, but do you know what he just did to me? Right? And it allows them to fall into conflict. So I would simply say, falling into an us versus them conflict and demonizing the other um, is far more a human uh, uh, capacity than it is to any particular religion or teaching, in, in, in my estimation. Uh, I got a couple of, um, I hope, quick answers to tough questions. Um, two people asking, what's the difference between Sunni and Shiite um, sects of Islam? Uh, simply put, I would say uh, they are very similar for the most part, um, but the distinction came after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, um, when uh, there were questions about succession, and what role his family would play. Um, and these sort of political and spiritual questions turned into theological ones, and they sort of uh, coalesced over time to theological positions. So some of the main sort of features um, would be uh, coming to believe that the, uh, the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, should be political leaders. Um, that, that would be the Shiite tradition. So they, they, they have... Um, uh, almost in a, an overlap between spiritual and political leadership. Um, whereas the Sunni Orthodox school, um, and Orthodox is a problematic word because nobody ever says that they're heterodox, right? Every, the Shiites see themselves as Orthodox as well. So, um, but the, the Sunni school, which is, which is uh, commonly translated as Orthodox, uh, viewed that um, succession to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Politically was something that was agreed upon by the community and uh, you know a, a different process rather than, than, than lineage or, or, or spiritual um, status. So, uh, but like I said, roughly you know they all read from the same Quran, the same five pillars. Um, they pray, they fast, uh, etc. Um, so all in all, I would say that, that they're the same, and it's on the same card. So I'm just going to. Um, what is the purpose of fasting in in Ramadan? Um, the purpose of fasting. Uh, it's interesting, the verse in the Qur'an that, that brings the, the, uh, the command to fast actually says that fasting is prescribed for you just as it was prescribed for those who came before you. And in the commentary, it says that the Jews and the Christians were prescribed fasting. So fasting is an Abrahamic uh, uh, devotion, and it's first and foremost a devotion to God. You know, it's almost like asking... You know why were there sacrifices, or what they are—they are, they are um, to show uh, to, to to gain nearness to God. But there's also a benefit to fasting, and, and I would say that fasting is a spiritual exercise in which uh, the ego is tamed. Right? Food, drink, and intimacy are some of the most instinctive desires that we have, and if we can put those in check, right? Um, for just 12 hours a day, right, 30 days a year at minimum, 
um, then we will have at least exercised our spiritual muscles to simply refrain and start to know what it means to control a desire and an impulse. The cup of water is right here, but I'm choosing not to drink it. I'm restraining myself. And that self-restraint has to carry over into other aspects of our lives. Um, one of the interesting things is the word incontinence, which is now almost always used medically, uh, meant in, if, if you look at medieval literature, does anybody know what incontinence meant for them? The inability to control desire, right? So when somebody would, would you know, fall into adultery, the, the, the conceptualization was they couldn't withhold themselves from a desire that they had. Right? They, they've, never held, they've never pulled the reins back on that horse, right? Um, and so the, definitely fasting has that as a spiritual exercise. It's to withhold from you know, the most basic human instincts um, to, 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 to gain some, some, some discipline, um, in a nutshell. So I'm going to pass it on. Somebody's asking, my daughter has made several close Muslim friends at school. Some are refugees, and maybe that changes some things. But as a mom, I've had difficulties getting on the same wavelength with the other moms. Are there any particular cultural difficulties that come into play with quote-unquote play dates? Um, I, I totally understand like both sides of the, of the issue, because I remember um, as a child, my mom having anxiety about me going to people's homes where they didn't understand our faith or didn't practice it and what um, s social situations I may be put into that would make me uncomfortable. And I think what's really important is having a conversation in maybe explaining that you are willing to hear about what may be limits for a Muslim child who's coming to your home, and I, I'll give you an example. My son told me about a conversation he had with a friend in high school who wanted him to come for a party at his home, a dinner party, and my son mentioned to me that he said no to the dinner invitation, and I asked him why. And he said the conversation went that his friend said, well, why won't you come? It's not like a party where it's guys and girls partying, and my parents are gonna be there, it's a dinner that I'm inviting you to, and we're not going to have alcohol because he knew that my son doesn't drink alcohol. And for Muslims, they would be very, practicing Muslims would be very uncomfortable around alcohol. And my son said to him, yeah, but you guys are planning to play, play poker, right? And he was like, yeah, what's wrong with that? They were going to have a poker night, the, the friends and the family. And my son says, I, I don't gamble. So what I explained to my son was, you know, it would, it would have been good to have that conversation with your friend explaining to him that these are the things that would make it uh, uncomfortable for me in a social situation. And your friend sounds very sincere and willing to do what it takes to make it comfortable for you. And these conversations are important to have. So I would, um, you know, there may be language barriers, obviously. And coming to a new country, people have all kinds of fears. And when they come, they may have been told by people back home that beware of this and beware of that. And, there are stereotypes about people who are not Muslim, just like people have about Muslims as well. So it would be important to just have a conversation about like, well, what, what would it be that would make it comfortable for your child to have a play date with my child? And um, it, sometimes it can, it can be nuanced, you know? Like, and so that, that'll lead me to the other question somebody asked is, I was in Egypt with my brother and a young Egyptian woman who was our guide. I needed to get her attention and I put my hand on her shoulder, but then I feared I had acted inappropriately. What's the proper way for a non-Muslim man to interact like that? Is all touch inappropriate? It's a very, very sensitive question. And it's things like that that do make um, some people uncomfortable about having to constantly explain why they do or don't do something. So for a practicing Muslim woman who is observing the limits of her religion that have been um, taught to her, yes, physical touch between men and women would be inappropriate. So oftentimes when I speak in churches and temples, when I speak on my own, I ask them to even make an announcement or let the congregation know ahead of time that I'm not comfortable uh, hugging men or shaking hands with men. I, I prefer the proper way to greet a woman is to put your hand on your chest and say hello.
And so, if you look at those etiquette manuals that they used to have here, even in the 60s, the 50s, and the 60s, they, they said that when you shake hands with a woman, um, here in the West, if it was the proper etiquette was to wait for the woman to extend her hand. If she extended her hand, then you know, a handshake's fine, but a uh, gentleman would wait. And so that would, that's the advice I would give for anyone who's curious about interacting with Muslim women, because what Muslim women, there's the entire spectrum. There will be women who will have no problem giving a hug, a handshake, whatever. Um, but I would wait to see um, how she decides to interact first. That works for people. And uh, I will pass the mic. So the question I have is, is the Torah and Psalms a part of the Quran? Uh, no, it's not a part of the Quran. The way we view the earlier scriptures is um, we believe and that we believe that they existed and that they were um, inspired uh, by God. Uh, we respect them, but we don't use them now to legislate our guidance. Um, and then the second question was, what role do angels play in our lives? So we believe that angels uh, inspire good deeds, and uh, they basically are God's workers, and they don't have the ability to um, disobey. They just do uh, God's bidding, basically. So they have many different kinds of jobs, um, some that uh, would affect us like on a regular basis. We believe that we have uh, scribes, um, angel that sits on our right shoulder, our left shoulder writes down all the good things that we do and the bad things that we do. Um, we believe that angels bring revelation, um, that they're involved with uh, death and, and they take the soul of the, uh, the human being when it's time for them uh, to pass. And we believe in guardian angels. Um, we believe in four archangels. Uh, Mikhail is, is right in. Is, Michael, um, Israel, Israel, uh, and Israfil, how would you say that? Israfil and um, Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel uh, is the archangel who um, has brought revelation. So um, when we uh, learned about the Prophet Muhammad receiving revelation, it was through angel Gabriel. And um, Israfil will blow the trumpet on the day of judgment. <laughs> And um, what's the English word? Okay, so the angel of death who will take the souls, and um, uh, and then, and then we also have you know believe like every drop of rain that falls from the sky has an angel with it. So just angels are everywhere doing all kinds of different things, and uh, they're made from light. That's what our belief is. Um, when I was uh, I studied at Zaytuna College, it's the uh, it's the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college in America. It's in Berkeley, California, uh, first in the Western Hemisphere, actually. And uh, so, after practicing law for seven years, I went and studied there and graduated in 2014. And uh, I learned something while studying Sharia, uh, Islamic law, in my Islamic law class. And uh, I. I was like, wow. Um, and so when we, when Muslims pray, uh, they wash before the prayer, and it's called being in a state of ritual purity. So it's called an ablution or a lustration. But in other words, Muslim washes their hands, arms, face, wipes their head, washes their feet. That's why you might sometimes see a Muslim with their feet in the sink. And you're like, what is he doing? Right? <laughs> That's what they're doing. They're trying to be closer to God. So, in that class, they, they, it, I was taught that uh, a Muslim is, gets reward if, before they hold an Old Testament or New Testament, they are in a state of ritual washing. They're in a state of ablution. In other words, to honor those old texts. You know? So that's what I learned uh, studying Sharia is to honor the Old Testament and I get rewarded by honoring it and to honor the New Testament and I get rewarded by honoring it and being in a state of purity. Um, the question I got was all the big
big five world religions have had violent extremist groups, but it seems Islam has had more than others. So I presume the other the five meaning Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, Hindu, and Buddhist is what I'm assuming. And true, they all have their share of extremists. Uh, the, the, the notion that Islam has more is patently false. Uh, I'll give you one example. You know, well, first off, let me just say, you know, it just takes a casual moment of logic to know that there's 1.7 billion Muslims in the world, which is like one in four human beings. So if a quarter of humanity has issues, then you know, this is a pretty devastatingly tragic world, right? Um, when we say Timothy McVeigh, Las Vegas shooter, the church shooting in the South, Jeffrey Dahmer, Una Bomber, et cetera, et cetera, countless school shootings. What we don't say is we don't say white Christian terrorists. Imagine if we did. Boy, it'd be a long list. It'd be a lot of dead people, white Christian terrorists. Yet, however, when there is someone who creates, uh, who, who, who causes death and carnage, and that person happens to be Muslim, is always Muslim terrorists, always. So the, the problem is, is, is labeling to a large extent. And, you know, and it's all part of this notion of, of, of policy of fear. When we are blanketed with these fearful and fear-mongering um, media and political views or what have you, then the only consequence is paralysis, intellectual paralysis. It doesn't allow us to be critical and, and ask that very fundamental question, why don't we use the term white Christian terrorists for all these people? Because they're all white male Christians. But why do we leave all of them Muslim terrorists. See, so we can't, we have to remove that dark cloud of fear above our heads so we can start to think critically. I think that's part of our uh, obligation. Um, the other question is, is there a religious reason for so much extremism or is it more due to a society struggling with poverty and lack of education? I think poverty, I'm not a sociologist, so I don't know the technical answers and statistics, but I would assume that poverty has a lot to do with a, a lot of aberrant behavior in different communities and societies. I actually saw it firsthand while I was in the Navy, um, traveling around the world in these very desperate places. And, um, you know, it takes a certain degree of economic stability to live an honorable life where you don't steal cheap, right? But when you can't, uh, when you don't have the basics to feed your family, then, you know, what is a higher moral standard, right? to steal bread to feed your children or not. So it's, it's, it's relativistic to some degree, and I think you know, poverty and lack of education has its role in creating disturbances in society. Um, but a religious reason for so much extremism, I would say no. I don't see textually uh, anywhere in, in Islam, or in the Quran, that, that would sanction any of these violent acts that are happening. In fact, I would attribute it to more for political reasons. Um, history has shown that under the banner of nationalism and religious fervor, you can get a lot of people moving in some particular political direction you want them to move. And you know, we, if you study these movements, you see that these leaders are actually doing that. They're using political, uh, uh, their political reasons are fueled by their nationalism or their religious fervor to get the people to start following that. And you know, let's not be, uh, Naive. I mean, we are right in the middle of this nationalism movement, whether here in the U.S. or in Europe. So we really do need to guard ourselves against that and not allow um, the nationalistic fervor to blind us into making um, you know, foolish policies. So I'm sorry for pontificating, but... <laughs> uh, so the next question I have is, what do you believe happens after the resurrection? Uh, there's a long, very detailed um, answer for this that I don't know, so I'm just going to keep it really simple. Um, the, so all we believe that uh, the angel, um, Mr. Raphael, will blow the trumpet and the, it'll be the day of judgment, and all people from all times will be gathered, and there will be um, a judgment in front of God, and uh, we believe in a scale where your good deeds and your bad deeds will be weighed, and um, God will judge whether you're someone going to paradise or to the hellfire. And um, ultimately, while there is a scale and there is a concept of um, good, good deeds versus bad deeds, we mostly uh, rely on God's mercy and that none of us actually earn paradise, but it's through God's mercy that we will uh, hopefully make it there. 
And uh, the, the next question is, do you believe in an afterlife? Absolutely, we do. And do all worthy Muslims qualify for heaven? Uh, again, anyone who gets into heaven, we believe, is purely on God's mercy, and that having faith in God is a prerequisite to enter uh, heaven, but not a guarantee. I wanted to just circle back really quickly to the question about play dates, just to um, give a little bit more detail about what a parent could do to make it more comfortable for a Muslim child to come over, if you were going to have that conversation with a parent. Uh, making it clear that you're willing to give the child space and privacy to complete their prayers because we have five prayers a day and prayer time comes in and sometimes parents or children don't know how to explain that they need to use the restroom to wash up and then they need a private spot in the house where they can go say their prayer and rather than having that uncomfortable conversation, people will just say, no, we can't come for a play date, you know? So if you can say, look, I, I know that uh, prayer time's important, we'll facilitate that, and also making sure that any meat that you serve to Muslim children would be halal, which is very easy to get. There are many halal stores here in the Bay Area. And um, yeah, those, those are probably the key things that parents worry about. Uh, oh, in media. I want to respect time. Um, we're, we're a little over. So that is just a preface that I'm going to get to this next one in 30 seconds. I apologize that it's brief, but it's in the interest of trying to respect the whole group's time. So this question says, I've been interested in studying the Quran uh, because it is such an important book, but much like the Bible, I find it a little tedious and boring. Can you recommend a study guide or a class or online resource to provide structure to my study and keep me motivated? Uh, I have a couple of resources. I don't. I don't. I, I will keep it brief. There's a book by Gary Wills called uh, "What the Quran Meant and Why It Matters." That's more of a sort of bird's eye view, and I think if you have that in place, will make your study easier. There's also, and it's easy to remember, it's called the Study Quran. The Study Quran. It'll help you to study the Quran. Uh, it is. A, it, it's, it's actually a great piece of scholarship, um, and I think that'll that, that'll uh, give you what you need. Do we have any other questions, or how are we good? Okay. If we did not answer any questions uh, because of time, uh, we want to honor that. So please do feel free to, to reach out uh, via Facebook or email. Munir is right there. Munir, can you turn it up? Everyone show your love for Munir. <laughs> and Carol, and Carol. So if you have any questions we didn't answer, we do want to honor them, uh, and so, so please, uh, some of us will hang around, uh, some of us might have to go, uh, but uh, if we didn't, just please do come up so we can answer that question. Um, I, was, uh, I was in a, my law, uh, practicing law one time, and uh, we were invited to you know, enjoy a, a, a Lakers game, because uh, I used to practice down south, and we had a nice box, you know. And I went to the game, and then uh, and we enjoyed the game, and then I, I had to pray. <laughs> so, uh, so I was like, "What am I going to pray?" So, uh, you know, I left the, the nice, comfy box, and uh, and, uh, and then I went in the hallway in the stadium, and there was this little like, crevice area, like you know, this corner. And so I went and prayed there, and then uh, and then these people uh, were walking by, and they're like, "Is he okay?" I was prostrating. And then one guy's like, I think he needs another beer. <laughs> and then they started taking pictures of me. <laughs> and I was like, good, may God bear witness that I'm praying. Take as many pictures as you want. <laughs> um, so I'm going to conclude uh, with just a small prayer. And it's uh, in this prayer, interestingly, this is what Muslims recite at a bare minimum. If a Muslim prays five times a day, uh, they recite this prayer in every unit of prayer. And uh, it's the opening chapter of the Qur'an. It's called the opening, uh, Al-Fatiha. Uh, and it's chapter one of the Qur'an, just a few verses. And in this chapter, uh, we refer to God's mercy four times, four times. And uh, four times 17 is 68, 68. So a Muslim is a, is a person of mercy. And if they don't understand that, they don't understand Islam. 
as God says, my mercy surpasses my anger. Uh, so God's prevailing attribute is mercy. God's prevailing attribute is mercy. Uh, and, and likewise for Muslim. And so uh, it's, this, this is a prayer and it's a supplication as well. I'm going to recite it uh, in Arabic. And what it means is, in the name of God, the source of mercy, the giver of mercy, all praise is due to God, Lord of the worlds, the source of mercy, the giver of mercy. Master of the day of judgment, it is you we worship and it is you we seek help from. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not of those who have went astray, who have earned your anger, or who have went astray. Amen. So that's the translation in English. And I'm going to just recite a small prayer in Arabic. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in Iyina Sirat Al-Mustaqeen Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim Ghayr Al-Mawtubi Alayhim we ask uh, God to bless this gathering, to bless everyone here. We ask God to reward everyone here, to gather us all in His heaven, and to take care of our worldly needs and our afterlife needs, and to restore harmony and tranquility, and serenity, and peace, and love, and to restore all of that in our marriages, in our families, in our homes, in our schools, in our governments, and in our world. And that's not difficult for God. And we ask God to use us as envoys of beauty, as vessels of peace, to wherever we go, you bring smiles to people, and we help people with their needs, as we traverse in this realm of difficulty called life, we ask God to make it easy for us and for others. We ask God to bless your community, to bless this community, to bless our nation, to bless our world. Amin, amin, amin. And we ask Him to send peace and blessings and mercy upon all the messengers and all the prophets. And all praise is due to you, God. Amin. Thank you very much for having us here. Remember, we're all worldlings. What are we? We're worldlings uh, in the Muslim tradition perspective. And we're, one day, hopefully, we'll all be reunited in our true home. I mean, thank you very much again uh, to this beautiful community. This gymnasium is gorgeous. This gymnasium, seriously, I feel like playing basketball. Uh, thank you. Have a wonderful evening.